people. <laughs> they'll see that. They'll see this. Okay. Using these microphones. Yeah. So I'll just pass it along. And hopefully they can hear me. I can hear myself. The second mic's over there. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, on this beautiful day. So uh, we thought we would wrap up the meeting with a session that involves a kind of roundtable discussion. Okay, from my point of view, this is breaking up as I talk. Is that really happening? Is that, no, it's okay? Okay. Uh, so we thought we'd wrap this up with a roundtable discussion. And I've asked our panelists, our distinguished panelists, to um, spend a few minutes each uh, answering one, two, or three of the questions that uh, we thought had, had come up. And the first was to uh, speak to themes that have emerged from this workshop that they think are worth, you know, where they found interesting, found intriguing, would like to highlight, would like to identify as cross-cutting themes or important themes. And the second is to, uh, if they found any themes that, um, that didn't quite, you know, become really uh, obvious themes from this, things that uh, may have been <clears throat> overlooked or things that may have been uh, you know, mentioned, been passing, but uh, didn't come back around. Uh, I thought they could have men uh, mentioned some of that. And then the third question is, what are the next steps for this community, for these two communities as we move forward? And so part of this is for us to hear from the panelists. Part of it is for us to have a discussion among this entire community. And part of it is to help inform the writing committee that's going to be preparing some sort of report, document, paper for, um, for this community to go forward. OK, so without further ado, I will just pass the mic along. Can you everybody introduce yourself and then? So my name is Jolante van Wyk. And I would like to so add uh, prepared a statement based on what I heard in some of the breakout groups that I thought that um, you may have an opinion about and want to um, comment on. So here it is. So the two communities, or our two communities, have been largely decoupled in the last decades, which has resulted into the parallel development of numerical modeling approaches. So what we heard here a lot uh, in the last two days were the problems that are still um, very much alive in both modeling communities. So the problems with the codes. So the codes are still very much in development. So one could make a statement saying that this might not be the right time to start uh, coupling these codes and move forward as a combined community. However, uh, because tectonics and surface processes are coupled at least to some degree, um, you could also say that code development in both communities should probably not continue to be parallel. It should be continued to integrate. And then I would like to quote one example of one of the breakout groups that I was in that illustrates uh, what may have gone wrong in this parallel development of the codes. So if you study the drainage system development and sediment infill of a rift basin, uh, people noted that it was found that, for example, the dip and depth of the border fault of a, of a rift basin, plus the, the uh, the shape of the hanging wall block of the rift basin, um, control to a large extent how your sedimentary basin fills up with sediments and how the drainage system develops. So in geodynamic models, um, as we just saw in John's talk, um, the dip of a fault, whether a fault is listric, what depths it actually roots, um, those are difficult to control results in geodynamic models but they matter very greatly in uh, surface processes and landscape evolution. So in other words, what matters a lot in one community may be not reproduced well at the moment in the other community. So the path forward uh, could be more communication and collaboration between these communities, maybe more um, uh, meetings such as this one, and maybe something even like a community research initiative. Should we break this up with question and response, or should we just each march through and give a, a statement? Any initial, any initial thoughts on that? Well, I'd just add to Yolanta's that there's also then the a step beyond, beyond model group one and model group two 
there's data as well. You need it's in order for the yeah you have to use it you have to really talk to it yep like a rock star <laughs> like the rock star you are. <laughs> no, I, I would just add that there's also the the um, observational uh, community. It's some point there that in perhaps their observation encompassed in this in the um, surface processes modeling group, but uh, you can't ignore that we have observables in there. Right. So thank you. All right. But with the caveat that this is an impossible task to come up with a few seemingly intelligent things to say, let's have a few notes here. So one thing that came across very often in the breakout sessions, and I think is actually why we're here in the first place, is the need for cross education between communities, right? So that each community needs to know well from the other group, what do we know? What don't we know? What would we really like to know? What would we Really like to be able to predict, or what sensitivities do we want to understand? Where are our complications? It's really essential to be able to know what, where's the common overlap between these problems that can be worked on that would be mutually beneficial and open to folks, right? So, and I, I think we're kind of just getting to that point now because now we've heard um, people on the surface processing side and more from some of the, what the challenges in the tectonics models are. Um, so in a way, we're beginning to get ready to have that um, conversation. But um, I, I guess one thing I'd like to add is I'd like to see the base, speaking of the data, have the base and analysis community drawn into this group more. Since many people have spoken to how the sedimentary record gives you a longer term preservation of what the surface is doing, right? Back to even tens of millions of years. So that community really should be Part of this conversation. In a way, if you think about it, at least in my mind, the world of coupling surface processes and tectonics, the way he started with Chris Beaumont and, and his groups, or a couple other Peter Coons and his group were doing it sort of about the same time. But for Chris Beaumont, anyway, came from a idea of trying to understand that stratigraphic record, right? So that's actually our that's our beginning, and we probably should uh, get back to it, I think. Um, so one question that I felt like we maybe partly because we're just beginning to complete the beginnings of that cross education. Other than the breakout groups, we haven't talked that much about what do we want a couple of models for, right? What are the questions, what are we trying to accomplish? So where are the opportunities to gain new understandings on, on both sides? Maybe there's some surface constraints that really help nail down some parameters or uncertainties of which approaches are best for the long-term tectonic models vice versa. And uh, all of us, have, many have talked about the difficulties of actually in both sides, the surface process and the tectonic side, you got a wide range of time scales that play a role for the observer record. Um, and how do you manage that, right? Even just the tectonic models, we're just hearing, how do you manage a model that maybe wants to be able to understand coast seismic displacements and longer term mantle convection? probably actually different models that have different needs in them. And same thing on the surface side. So how do we tackle that? And anyway, we're having a conversation at dinner, and thinking about what do you need? What are the many different categories of questions you might ask? Um, so we know that tectonics affects surface processes and has an influence on landscape. So as we started off with a nice talk by Allison, there are really good cases where you might want to use a tectonics model to drive a landscape evolution model to get better information how the surface responds. So in that case, you want a fully resolved landscape evolution model to be able to take on board that intensity of shaking or whatever it is, the pattern of uplift, the pattern of subsidence. Um, on another class of, of questions, it's still uncertain whether surface processes really do influence tectonics. Like, is there a two-way coupling? A lot of us think so. Most of our models predict that there would be so, and it should be strong. It's been hard to prove with field data. Um, but in that case, maybe the only things that matter for you can have a very simple surface process model because the, the effect on your uh, the, the 
in your upper crustal stress state, right? So maybe getting the mean topography right is time elevation noisy. But Greg Tucker pointed out to me last night that you gotta be careful because what if your observable data that you wanna use to test that model is at a higher resolution of data? So that you need to know more details about that topography or the sediments accumulating in the lake or whatever it is. Depending on what data you're gonna to use to test those models, you might need more resolution. Or an intermediate class like the um, uh, Adina's models looking at subduction zones, right? Um, where the amount of sediment coming off, the nature of the sediment coming off might change the rheologic properties of the fault. Right? You need a higher degree of resolution. So anyway, I'm rambling a little bit there. But uh, it's important to think about what the nature of the question you wanna ask a coupled model to help guide what's the appropriate way to try to couple those models. There's probably several different classes you might wanna take. Um, right, so I guess only last thing just to, to climb it here. One of the sort, there are potential opportunities where surface observables can help constrain models of say mantle dynamics. One of the ones that our communities talked about a fair bit is the dynamic topography predicted by mantle convection models, where different mantle convection models predict completely different histories of dynamic topography. Some none, some a lot, very different time scales. Those are surface observables that if we could nail down, say the upland history of the Colorado Plateau, we might be able to start figuring out what are the better parameterizations of mantle convection many other ways to do this. Anyway, it's just one idea. It's good to think about what do we want a couple models for? What are we trying to explain? And where are the opportunities to have mutual benefit? So does that mean the need is for collection of more data or for synthesis of data that is already exists or for somehow consolidation of data and then uh, ways to link it to the models? Or are there new data sets that need to be collected? Oh, well, as a very general answer, I would say that both fields are ultimately data limited fields. So you can do all kinds of modeling you want, but in the end, that model's got to be trying to explain some data. And one of the biggest challenges is often there's a lot of uncertainty in that data, like the case I was just talking about, the, we had new histories of. Um, regional uplift that might be attributed to dynamic topography, mantle convection, then we could do something. But most everywhere where that's hypothesized, there's great debate and great uncertainty of whether it uplifted or certainly when it uplifted. So um, yeah, we need the data. We need the modeling capabilities to test against that data. But So I, I'd like to start out with something that will never go out of fashion, uh, and not just specific to this field, but uh, good quality numerical methods and software. So there are a lot of opportunities there for improving the accuracy, robustness of numerical methods, um, and for being able to use those methods and uh, software to formulate the inverse problems. And so one, area that I think is relatively overlooked is uh, developing gradients of misfit functions with respect to parameters. So there's often spatially distributed parameters. There's just a lot of parameters that we don't know. And we choose them somehow. We choose them based on some observations and some intuition. And, um, but it, it, uh, it, being able to take the gradient of some kind of misfit that says, how well do we agree with data? Um, it, it, that's something where there are good mathematical tools and we could write software in that way. Um, sometimes it constrains the choices that we would make for numerical methods. So if all we're doing is a forward prediction based on a known initial and boundary condition, um, we have a lot of choices of methods. And if we want to make a prediction whose derivative is not noisy, then we have a subset of those uh, methods. 
And so thinking more about formulating that inverse problem, about developing our models and making them fit together in a way that uh, can be used to solve those uh, inverse problems. I think it, that's definitely an important area. Um, generally, modularity of software, um, the way that we go about um, extending it to add new processes and um, the way that we exploit parallelism. These are all important things that we need to think about. Um, looking particularly at how we compare with data. So it's something that I think would be really useful is software components that just provide misfit functions, that just say how different are we from these uh, maybe very multimodal sets of observations. So there are lots of different observation types. If I make predictions from a tectonics model or from coupled tectonics and surface processes, um, I'm gonna have lots of possible outputs that could be tested. And the thing is, in, like no one person or no one research group has all of the expertise to go into all of those areas, find the appropriate data, um, figure out how to compare the predictions that we're making on the appropriate time scales. I think that's something we can actually formulate into libraries and it, that would be really useful. Um, and so looking at coupled problems, right now the way that we tend to go about doing that is uh, to generalize slightly, surface processes people use laughably crude models of the tectonics and tectonics people use laughably crude models of surface processes. And sometimes we target problems that are like nearly overlapping, but we use different methods and the way that we try to agree with data, what the parameters that we're choosing to infer, um, they may not be very physical because it's actually a coupled problem. And so if we put that together, we may get better solutions. And so we're asking about like, where are the grand challenge problems where we really need coupled models? And it may be, these are problems that we're already working on but we're getting kind of non-physical solutions or we're having to over-constrain our models. Um, we're specifying boundary conditions that aren't physical or we're specifying some parameters in our models that aren't physical. They allow us to fit some data, but we're not really happy about it. And ideally, when we couple the models, we would get out really physical states, things that we you know, can believe in and, and really justify. So it, it maybe we don't need to look for new problems, we just need to, uh, care more about the, the quality of our, um, of our inference. And so there's a, a lot of questions in that area. So I'm, uh, I really think the idea of having sort of standard components, modular things to calculate Data misfits is a, a, a very useful and generalizable um, and important step. And I think that um, a big piece of making that usable that I think we've sort of been dancing around, but no one has really said specifically, is that when you have different types of data, each related to something you're trying to fit with your model, figuring out how you combine those two things into something that an inversion is dealing with is not necessarily trivial. So this would be def functionally defining weights. And so uh, uh, that's sort of another piece, another layer of thinking about the model data comparison and inversion that um, uh, I think would need to go along with the uh, misfit component idea that you have. Yeah, so one way of dealing with uncertainty there is if those misfit functions were appropriately scaled, then they could be combined kind of without needing to do a lot of custom work. It wouldn't be so application specific to combine these like multiple contributions towards a loss function. Uh, but it, it, it's the uncertainty in the data that it needs to show up there. And of course, uncertainty from your model needs to come through as well. Yeah, I, I guess my thought is, I, I think figuring out how to scale it right in a general way, I would love to find out that it's easy. <laughs> uh, 
Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you were getting at was, um, let's say we have two different constraints. Let's say we have a gravity field and we have uplift field. How do we weight those? How do we decide which one is more important? Well, so I would say it should come from how accurate that measurement is. And so if we have really accurate measurements, then we should try to agree very well with those. Some observations can be really sensitive to the molly running and the questions you're asking and other, you might get the right gravity field with any model, but you, right, it might be another parameter that's really sensitive to whether you've got the rheology right or whatever it is you're after. So for me, I would think that would be the way you would weight that we use to judge model success. But yeah, so uh, actually, uh, I think when you talk about both inverse problem and also model uncertainty, which means you need to run at least a couple of times of the model. So I think before you actually doing that, you need to make sure you can run a couple of like a hundred times the model first, I mean the computation source and things. Or, or you can kind of simplify your model to do some kind of easy way to run the simulations. Yeah, you, you definitely need the forward model to be reliable and fast in order to solve inverse problems. But it, there's no way around that. Also, another question over there or not? Did I? Am I making this up? I, I imagine we can get back to this one, sorry. Let me remind everybody. <laughs> Let me remind everybody in the room to please introduce yourselves, including the panelists, <laughs> so that because there are people online who can't uh, completely tell. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jed Brown. Uh, I'm here at CU Boulder, and my background is in computational science. And I, the second speaker, Kellen Whipple from uh, Arizona State University, uh, geomorphologist. Uh, so, um, so I'm Liran Goran. I'm from Ben Gurion University in Israel, and um, so I, I actually I kind of so Luis told us that uh, the discussion here should help the people writing the white paper tomorrow. So in a way, I think the people that write the uh, white paper are expecting maybe they expect that this whole meeting to come up with the grand scientific challenges and questions. And although we discussed them a lot, we haven't been able to name them. We didn't really identify them. So maybe it's much harder than we expected to come up with these uh, grand challenges. And to state the obvious, maybe we were not able to identify them because uh, as long as we don't have um, highly detailed um, surface process and geodynamic models that are coupled, we cannot really identify all the possible coupling, but we are just imagining them or even we cannot even imagine them because they are unknown. So maybe we first need to have sufficient amount of such coupled models and simulations to identify these very special coupling or feedbacks, and then we can find out these, these grand challenges. Um, so I would also like to maybe offer an imaginable such a feedback and this comes from uh, Pietro Sterni, who's a postdoc in the University of Geneva. He actually asked me to tell you about it. So, um, so the geodynamic community has recently uh, been able to identify an interesting feedback between uh, climatic oscillations and magma production. So I'm referring here to the glacial interglacial cycles that possibly control the volume of magma produced at mid-ocean ridges and controls, therefore, the topography of the oceans. So maybe there are um, such interesting coupling that involve surface processes. For example, if you have very intensive erosion, then you can depressurize and uh, produce more magma, and that can affect your climate, and that can affect the efficiency of your surface processes. 
Okay, so that might be a classical problem to address with a highly detailed um, both surface process model and, and tectonic model. And um, maybe, and, and Louise also asked us to um, maybe suggest some, some goals can be um, uh, for the near future or far future. So I think that the, the last session that we just had might point out that maybe a, a very near future goal could be to define um, an interface uh, such that any um, current or future model from both communities um, would like to fit to this interface in terms, of, in terms of the input and output that we supply. And then when maybe we are slightly more mature, we can, we can more easily couple uh, such models that were not intended initially to be coupled, but to be just to support the interface. Yeah, so I guess in a sense, I agree. Um, oh, yes. My name is Sarah, and I am a postdoc in Melbourne University. Um, so I agree that, that maybe that, that's why we haven't been able to formulate what the big challenges are, because maybe we just have to, I don't know, make a list of the 10 grand questions that we actually want to address. And then based on the questions, then we can figure out which models we need to come up with. Um, and I guess, in a, in a sense, that would be kind of invoking the scientific method of like, which questions do you have instead of just making the models for the sake of making them. This is Nicole Gasparini from Tulane University. So I'm going to try and be half glass half full, which is very much not my normal personality. Um, but I feel like in this meeting, we have had people who are really, really super experts in geodynamic modeling and surface process modeling. And the most interesting thing for that surface process person is to like go to the thing that we don't understand about distributions of floods and try to study it and like poke all the holes in everything that we know and try to find all these details because that's super exciting for us as a scientist, right? Um, and so we've been maybe motivated so much by our own individual kind of questions that we focused on all of the unknowns in this um, meeting and put forth sort of like, here's all these warts that we have, right? And all of our models are so bad and we need to know all of these other things. But on the flip side, we get a lot of things right, right? And so one question I have is like, how perfect do we need to be before we start doing this coupling, right? Because we're never going to be perfect. And so I sort of loved what you said, which was some of these questions might come forward when we start doing it, because a lot of us have just been sitting in our own box, not doing it. So we're not even focusing on those cool questions that are going to come out when we actually start the coupling. So I think that's a really great way to think about it. Jean Braun from uh, my BFZ. Um, sorry, in Germany, it was not fake. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, I just want to say a few things regarding the big scientific uh, question that we're trying to address here. Maybe just to remind people that in many cases, um, all the, the models that actually help answering or trying to answer the question, that uh, in the first instant they were actually used to define the question. And I think it's something we shouldn't really, you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a big question, but we shouldn't make this dependent on big questions. Um, and I see also that a lot of um, answers to big questions, or big questions we have discovered that the, uh, the modeling is talking about in coupling tectonics with climate, um, have come because we have coupled erosion models with tectonic models. So, you know, if my recommendation 
something we could do with the two communities is um, really work on the interface and, and through this give the opportunity of, to any member of one of the two communities to use the tools of the other community without having to either reinvent the wheel or worry about how to use it properly. And I really like Louis, Louis Morese's talk, which is, I think, a great example of how this can be done. He presents a way of, look, guys, you need MPI, and you need MPI here. Is These other guys have never done anything with MPI, and there's a way we can do it too. And he made it broad enough. You know, it's not really specific to one uh, landscape evolution model. But I will also say that something we really need, and I agree with Kelly on that one, for this to work, we need also to co-educate the two uh, communities. Um, you know, I, I'm sure many of the geodynamic modelers have you know, really no idea of the difference between maybe glacial erosion and fluvial erosion, and in which circumstances, in, in, to answer Kip's question, one would be more suitable than the other. And I think we're down to using a simple computer model for the whole Earth. So I think that's, that's you know, if anything, I, I would like to see in the white paper could be things along these lines that are fairly broad and we should obviously get into the details of the different models. But, but I think that's really essential um, to not just define questions, but, but also to give us the means to find new, really exciting questions. I'm going to go for it. All right, this is Eric Middlestead from University of Idaho. Uh, sorry about the cold if I start coughing. Uh, so, uh, um, so there's been a lot of things covered already. Uh, you know, I'll do my best to add something new. Um, one of the themes that keeps coming up and has been uh, mentioned several times in this panel, uh, it was just brought up by Nicole in a different way, is that the meeting of these two communities has caused a really interesting phenomenon where the communities have looked at themselves and said, oh, you want to use what we use? Oh, well, we got to fix all this before I'll let you use it. And uh, I think that's a really important step. And actually, I think that's one of the most productive things to come out of this meeting is for us to reassess our own communities and, and even down to our fundamental assumptions. So, um, you know, as Arthur pointed out uh, in the talk earlier today, is the viscous formulation, starting from the viscous formulation for long-term tectonics, is that the right paradigm? Um, is the stream power model even the right way to go? Or should we do fully dynamic physics? Um, you know, these types of fundamental questions are really important, but I also like what Nicole is bringing up in that when, when are we good enough? When are we gonna start coupling? And I think we should start thinking about that and working together. And, and I think one of the ways forward, and this is something that didn't come up very much except in passing, was what is this coupling? What is this coupling gonna look like? What information can long-term tectonic models give to uh, surface process models? And what information can surface process models feed back into tectonics? So for example, long-term tectonic models don't just give you uplift or don't just give you lateral motion. They can give you information about stress. They can give you information about what lithologies are being exposed when. Um, they can give you information about damage. So that's a lot more information than just uplift or lateral motion that can be incorporated into these surface process models. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more information that can go the other way. I'd love to hear some people comment on that besides just how much material have we moved and where have we moved it. Um, but I think those kind of discussions before we go through the process of coupling these codes are important because we want to know what information we can use from each other's models. And then that will help us hopefully answer more interesting questions. So that's all I wanted to cover because a lot of other stuff has already been done. Paul Eitzmuffer from uh, University of Pittsburgh. I'm a postdoc there. And echoing uh, Jean Brown's and Aaron Gorham's uh, comment on the grand challenge mm -hmm. that is facing, also, we are not giving you the model unless we fixed it. Um, that maybe one of the grand challenges I'm wondering is 
can you provide the community with the tool that has been tested so that we can then build up those research questions so that we feel confident is that can you give me a couple tool now i'll test things like shall i now do uh, use the stream power model and uh that it work on the surface or any other model and then let's see maybe there is then some there's a difference that i can actually measure so what i would need is like when i want to fix a car i need my tool and the grand challenge can't be solved fixing a car without the tool so i think maybe one of the grand challenges is providing the community with that tool University of Mainz, Germany. Uh, <coughs> one of the things, so I don't completely agree that there is the tool, because as a matter of fact, in the geodynamics community, we have seen many codes developed over the last 10 years. Uh, I think we have made much more progress than I had thought would be possible 10 years ago. Now we can do 3D multi-physics problems. We have learned a lot of lessons about that, and the most important lesson is that we should not uh, we should not force one code upon the community, but let the different research groups do what they think is best. We don't actually know the best way to to uh, solve these equations, um, and and that's why I think providing a framework that allows this uh, and and takes common uh, features of all different codes that have been developed is very useful thing to do. And it turns out there are maybe like four or five now 3D parallel codes in the community. And they all essentially are based on Patsy as an underlying package. And that is because Patsy actually works. We're very happy to have one of the main developers of Patsy sitting in the middle here. And thanks to that, we have also learned that if you want to go into more complicated multi-physics problems, like couple magma migration, with it is sphere dynamics, uh, you cannot have a loose coupling at the top. You cannot say, oh, okay, I do one time step with the Darcy fluid flow, and then I do one time step with the Stokes code, and then I kind of iterate around and I hope that it will converge. Uh, this doesn't work. What actually needs to be done is you need to do a tight coupling at the solver level uh, within the codes. And within Patsy, there are now frameworks to do this very easily. And so, so one common thing is that actually Patsy appears to work for big supercomputers. The other thing is that uh, many, many people are now using more and more this kind of Python frameworks. And uh, I think the best way forward in trying to provide this coupling is to, to allow some kind of framework based on Patsy uh, that allows you to kind of call one geodynamic solver step with one particular code, which you could change, and then couple it with a sort of processes framework, also from within Python, that would work in parallel as well. I think there has been a lot of progress in the development of this Python tool that is very well supported, and uh, I think that would make it feasible. Providing one tool, I think, is the wrong thing. making sure that we can use them, we have access to them, that they're explained, they're talking about the interface, that because some of us don't know how to code and they want to use their different parameters and then use those models and maybe have a module set up, uh, which is partly already done uh, here where we can use different uh, modules and then model um, the way we think we can answer our question. So um, yeah, I very much agree with uh, Liron and Tom Brown that, um, Give us a set of tools or one tool, I agree entirely. It was more, give us as many tools as possible, but um, they should be somewhat validated and, and accessible in a, in a way, let's say, in a sim, let's say a simple DUI, a, a user interface, for example, or a, a nice manual, because often receiving code and start reading the code for three months to understand the code, I think is uh, something that belongs to the past and shouldn't be uh, done in the future. So I think this is, uh good idea. I think having these interfaces is great. And I think systems has certainly led the way here. 
And I think one thing that we all need to keep in mind, and this is something that's going to have to come from the community, is if we want to do this as a joint community, there's got to be some talk with NSF or other funding agencies because we can't rely on some hero person to go out and use their research time to do this. So um, I think this is a great idea and there's, it's good to have discussion about this, but at some point, you know, there's gonna have to be some, some actual work into trying to get funding for this. It's something, some kind of systems type um, uh, organization. Maybe it could be called computational infrastructure for geodynamics or something similar to that <laughs> in a way. Right, I mean, the, these organizations, these two organizations that are here have been, have a lot of experience. So actually we're in, that's an optimistic statement that we can basically build on the infrastructure that we've already, that we've built and that we've developed and the knowledge that we've learned about how to do it. So I, I'm actually very pleased to hear that suggestion because it's something we, have learned how to do and have some experience doing and you have some experience doing the csdns so we have basically the ability to do it we have the capability of doing it we don't always have the capacity to do it at the scale that is being requested right so that's where the resources come in to to expand the capacity to do this this kind of thing yeah okay i'm going to open it up oh wait was there uh, uh sean gallon colorado state university um, so I just want to change gears a little bit. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter about this. So how many people here model and want data sets to constrain them? This is an obvious question. I hope it's how many people here collect data that can be used to constrain them? How many of you know of databases that are easily accessible where people that are modeling Sets exist. Can you give a handful of examples of maybe some cosmogenic nuclei data sets, maybe some areas where people have compiled thermodynamometry, but one of the data sets that I collect a lot of is you know, terraces, other metrics of deformations, Frank Rosalia would call paleogeodesy, paleogeodetic markers. So those exist for GPS data. They don't really exist for a lot of these classical measurements that we make. Um, and if we had sort of a community effort to compile those data sets into a geostandardized form so that they're easily accessible and so they can be used to inform the model, that might be another way forward. And I see that as sort of a grand challenge to try to standardize these data sets, not just publish them in the paper, but really get them out to the public so they can be utilized in a really easy way. Eitan Shelef, University of Pittsburgh. Eitan Shelef, University of Pittsburgh. Um, so I, th I think to add to the point of um, how perfect should our models be in order for us to find them. And I think this ties to the issue of scale that came up again and again in, in the discussion. And perhaps a way to guide the questions we ask is to find the scales that are both community Use this as a tool to hone on the questions that you can answer, try to answer with the modeling tools that we're currently have. This is Katie Bernhardt. Um, so, one thing that came up last year at the CSDMS meeting related to coupling human systems models and surface processes and surface dynamics models was that oftentimes, um, you know, in an ideal world, a, a person in one community is going to be able to have enough time or be able to find a collaborator or something like, be fortunate enough to find a user manual that is comprehensive enough. So they really understand the other model that they're connecting with, but for a lot of really reasonable reasons, that's not always possible. And, and so, Oftentimes, the thing you really want to know is, you know, what can't I interpret about this other model? What shouldn't I believe is true or what isn't necessarily 
uh, feature that is a, a robust result. And, and one of the things we came up with in, in a breakout session in, at CSDMS last year is, you know, we, we don't really have a way to incentivize uh, people being really honest about that aspect of their models. And that uh, that is often one of the most important things in figuring out how to uh, appropriately couple and then interpret the results of a coupled model, especially if maybe you only know one half of the coupling really well. So uh, I wanted to respond to Sean's point there. Um, so if I'm not in your field and I make some predictions with my model and it's coupled to some, say, surface process model that uh, where, where in principle it could be related to the field observations that you have, the problem is I'm going to have to understand like your uh, field collection techniques. I'm going to have to understand spatial and temporal correlation in your model. Uh, I'm going to have to understand, like, how do we do upscaling with that sort of data? And th this is hard. This is actually, like, it takes a lot of intellectual effort to do that. And so uh, one thing you could do is, along with your data, you could provide an uncertainty model. The problem is that those uncertainty models are usually really high dimensional and they're hard to represent. And so a different way to represent it is to have it be like a posterior distribution. So a distribution that I get to sample. So I say, here's my prediction, and you tell me how probable that is. So how close to your data is that? And embedded in that, in that function is you know, how close did we get to the observations that you actually made? That's in fact what we need when we're trying to, uh, to solve an inference problem. So we're trying to understand are all the parameters in our coupled model. We really just need to know how probable is it as compared to the observations that you've made. And so th that's basically my suggestion in terms of loss functions is help us out, make it so that we can actually put together these components. Because if we're talking about a coupled model that has all kinds of surface processes plus tectonics, this isn't like two or three areas. This is like at least 10 different kinds of data sources. And it just isn't feasible for any one person or group to understand all of those things. Can I, can I add, oh, sorry. Can I, add, can I add something in response to what you just said about this? So, uh, and a point that's come up in a couple of places has having to do with uh, essentially making it possible for people to use models, especially in areas where they're less familiar. And so I'll just lob a couple of ideas out there and see what resonates. And one of them is that, um, you know, one way to do this is to have tutorials, training, essentially training. And by training, I mean really sort of pretty intensive, you know, maybe um, a few days of hands-on work. One of our uh, software development teams has done this really well, Hyleth, uh, which is sort of short-term crustal deformation scales in which they've offered both in-person and online training that lasts a week. And it has uh, um, built in what they call tinker time. <laughs> Basically, you start and you, you learn to use the software to solve certain sort of standardized problems. And you go away for a few hours, an afternoon or so on, with the expectation you're going to keep working on it. And then you come back. And by that time, you have some questions. You're stuck. You, know, you have things that you can't figure out. The tutorial continues and uh, the tinker time continues. And so it's kind of this way of basically building, building expertise, which, as you can imagine, takes a lot of dedication, both from the people preparing the tutorial, tutorials to make and delivering them, but also from the people who are taking them. But it does result in a, in a, um, a cohort of people who are uh, more expert users than they were when they walked in the door, obviously. The next level up often involves basically bringing users and elevating them so that they become user developers, where they're contributing something back to the software. And not everybody wants to do that, but some people do want to do that. And it kind of opens the door to understanding what's under the hood to continue the car repair <laughs> metaphor, uh, and essentially um, allowing people to even contribute back in a modest way still gives them kind of more of an investment in that. 
software. And so those are two things. In terms of the quality of the of software, one of the exercises that we found has helped with that is uh, what we call benchmarking. And usually this, but it's much more than running a bench, than a benchmark. It often involves a group of people getting together, defining problems that they believe they understand the solution to, and then uh, putting them out there to the world and having people run them on their software with guidance, with oversight, <laughs> so that we know what's being run and then uh, getting them back together. That is a very big uh, dedicated effort. It can take several years from start to finish to get that done, but it does give you kind of confidence in the models and also knowledge about the models. And uh, it's some, something that this group might wanna think about what sorts of benchmarks in the future would you like to see in terms of these couple of problems? So how would you go about defining them? What, be, what would even be the process of going about defining tractable problems that could be done in this way. It's a long-term effort, but it really does increase everybody's sort of understanding of what the models do and also confidence in the models. And so I would really recommend it. And then we also talk about publication of software and how to publish it and how to treat it. This is part of this reward system, right? How to treat it as an intellectual product, because it is in the same way that a publication is an intellectual product. We're used to the sort of academic publication sphere, but we are uh, trying to um, push, and there's a much, actually much, much larger scientific community trying to do this, and information scientists and so on, to try and push recognition of this sort of effort as a, an intellectual product, making it both sort of publishable and then citable. And that citability means that when the model uses something, uh, it says exactly what it did, what is in the model, what model version was used, so what capabilities that has. And that really helps with replicability of science, which is, of course, fundamental to the scientific enterprise, right? So those are kind of, I'm just throwing those out there as things to think about as you think about the next steps, whether you like any of those ideas or don't like, whether you, some of them you might think, well, that's too much work. Some of them you might think that's really essential to what we do. These are kind of ideas to consider as you move forward. Uh, Rolf Falta, University of Exeter. And uh, just one of the things I've really picked up from this meeting uh, is learning a lot um, about geodynamics that I wasn't previously aware of. And I was thinking it'd be very useful. One, one thing I'm trying to assemble in my head is a, a list of things that are fairly well known in geodynamics that I didn't know, but suddenly but also a list of key problems in geodynamics that, that uh, my community may or may not be able to help with, but at least we know they're outstanding uh, in some people's minds. So just, just having that kind of knowledge of capabilities and key outstanding questions, particularly insofar as they interface with the surface in a way that I find might someday be able to help with. One of the things that I found very interesting was the problem of scale, and that uh, seeing all these excellent talks from computational geodynamics side of things, where very large problems uh, are being increasingly sliced uh, into higher, higher resolution using all kinds of uh, new um, options for parallelism to, uh, to really decrease that resolution to a spatial scale that is uh, something that we can tackle at the Earth's surface. And similarly, seeing how some of the Earth's surface models are scaling up to larger problems that might be interfaced with the geodynamics community. So other than the kind of list of the key outstanding questions uh, that both of the groups can provide that, that might be helpfully addressed by the other, maybe just uh, an idea of where key scales can correlate spatially we can meet at in the middle where we can be most helpful to each other in terms of providing feedback that we can work with on both the spatial scale and the key scale. Does anybody want to reflect on that or not? If not, I'm going to ask uh, or going to present a question. Uh, Okay, so here's the question uh, from online uh, from uh, Lorraine. 
and she ask, uh, asks, is there a straw or current challenge problem that will illustrate what we know, what is not known, and what our capabilities are? So either to the front or, or to anybody in the audience. Well, I mean, my, my comment was sort of along similar lines, and I, I, I wanted to come back to what you, you, know, you mentioned earlier, that the ASINs is, is where it all started. And, and to me, some of, the, some of the issues that have come up over and over are sort of about validating and examining a cascade of natural laboratories, right? We sort of want to understand, does our general understanding of plate tectonics and continental dynamics allow us to predict the sediment flow? right now in this place. And that's really important for planetary evolution and for the carbon cycle. We want to understand, say, for, you know, for, for a continent like Africa, do we get the overall transport load? Like zooming in, we got major orogenic belts of the Cenozoic, you know, the Andes and Tibet. And then, you know, sort of going down in scale, you know, people have, of course, done this for, for centuries, trying to understand transports, surface transport processes, all these different scales. But I think it would be somehow useful to, to just sort of rally around this concept that we need to understand these different laboratories to, to check, you know, what are the scales where which algorithm applies, the scales that we have to capture. And what is sort of ringing in the back of my head is, of course, how are we, how are we going to get you know, money for this? And, of course, to one extent, it's source to sink, right? This is, you have to lie about it. The oil industry is interested in the same sort of stuff. But that is an opportunity. And then, of course, we have things like the Integrated Earth Systems Program, which is just about that. But as a geodynamicist, I always feel like IES as a program expects this fully formed model, whereas we are just talking about, well, how should we cover it? And somehow, when you get involved in these projects, you always get stuck. You never get it done right. And so I feel like as a service process model, as a geodynamicist, if we could somehow get get a more coherent strategy going to have these IES kind of collaborative things be driven by examining these systems and be serious about the model, right? To not have, as you might have, I've experienced this, right? Oh, we didn't get funded. Let's ask a geonemesis next time around to get funded and then no one really cares, right? But I think there is an opportunity here to think about the overall transport budgets, like you said, right? on the basin scale and what's happening like in this mountain with the basin scale and on a global scale, right? If you want to get at atmospheric evolution on planets, things like that. Think about cascades of validation exercises for natural laboratory. Alison Anders, University of Illinois. Um, the one thing I was really struck by in this meeting is that unlike the climate erosion tectonics coupling that we were talking about back when I was in grad school where topography was the only connection, um, I think we are starting to think more about other ways that they might connect. And I think the example that really struck me as one that might be a place where there are gains on both sides um, is about fracture spacing or damage or something like that, which is increasingly being thought about in the surface processes and uh, critical zone uh, communities um, as being driven by topographic stresses, but also by the tectonic history of things. And then this seems like this is quite involved in strain localization and, and similar problems from the geodynamic standpoint. So my eyes are really opened about how there's something else that might be a way that, that the talking happens. Um, but also that maybe these some of these outstanding problems are not actually so disparate. I mean, is it is if this is really a problem about how the properties of the material change as they move through the system toward the surface and then in transport on the surface, it's really more of a continuum thing than a splitting everything into the surface and the subsurface. Um, so that I don't know, that struck me as like a, a new problem. Perhaps all of you have thought of that already before, but that was new to me. 
if I could just respond to that, it's actually a really nice opportunity for possible, you know, mutual interest and joint benefit. It's one of the big unknowns, as was mentioned, I think, in Brian's talk, especially. How does that erosion efficiency depend on material property? Um, we need, well, we need a lot more data. We probably need some theoretical thinking. We ought to work how, how do we make that connection, make the robust measurements of material properties, translate them to erodibility, essentially. Because we're going to need that to know how that fracturing then manifests in the landscape. So it's a cool common problem. And it, exactly in that context, um, it also matters these kind of interface properties like uh, plutonic activity that changes a mountain range. And that's something that right now maybe nobody really feels like they own. What strikes me is a lot of people saying, I didn't know that you knew this, and I didn't know that this was an open scientific question. I think that's really very interesting. Uh, that's already a benefit, I would say. Are there other thoughts that add to this? Looks like people are maybe running out of steam. Are there other thoughts from the panel? identify grand challenge questions or good questions or at least think about how to do them. <laughs> that would that would be a major contribution. <laughs> I'm Carrie Johnson of uh, University of Nevada Reno I'm a postdoc and I have a question for the geodynamics tectonics community what's the we've been hearing a lot about big Mantle convection, um, plate subducting. What's the small scale of the modeling that you guys do? How how fine do you get? How far are we from this idea of modeling fracture spacing or the, the stuff at the scale that a river might interact with or or surface processes? Who wants to take that on? Well, I may not offer a complete answer, but I mean the smallest models we saw in the talks were a single fault. Um, so that's a common scale that people look at. Um, you know, it's just about scaling the size of your model. If you wanted to look at joint spacing in a 100 meter by 100 meter by 10 meter area, you could set up that problem. Um, now there's gonna be comments on that. But. Uh, the, the same mechanical equations are also valid on the nanometer scale. Yeah? So as long as you can resolve the grain scale or whatever, then you can use the same kind of codes. You can use the same approach to model planetary accretion. You can model uh, behavior of crystals in the magma. You can model things towards to determine the permeability of porous rock or relative as long as the physics doesn't change. But if you go to the earthquake cycle where things are very fast, then you need to start adding the period changes a little bit and add the motion towards the edge. But also that are things that we have to think about in terms of approach and it's quite a bit of complicated and capable of reproducing lab experiments or working with size of the So they're very versatile. But of course, I cannot address that and at the same time model the whole flow. That is, you are limited somewhat in the range. Um, yeah, this is Fedra Upton from GNS in New Zealand. I'm basically, I say what Boris said, but we can definitely, you choose your scale to a certain extent based on your problem. And, the, the, you know, so we can model the Alpine Fold of New Zealand at several different scales, but it's just what processes are you looking at and what question you're trying to answer. And we can take, say, a, a plate scale model, take the boundary conditions from that and 
and scale them down to a much smaller model so that we can look at the valley scale or you know the fault zone on on sub kilometer scale um yeah so right and it, just just to add to that it's this question about you know the continuum approximation right? most of the stuff we do we assume that the, the microphysical processes and the microphysical heterogeneities can be averaged over on some meaningful scale and some some point that's going to break at some point you're going to run into you know, we don't want to deal with dislocation motions if we have a viscous creep point but if you really want to zoom in at some point you're going to have to deal with material heterogeneity that you may or may not know so it's a question of averaging right this come it's come up over and over again and we need to you know do this in a formal way Organization approaches and course manuals and stuff this is small or you can try to find approximate descriptions i think a lot of it hinges on the validity of these approximations and when they break down you have to be really careful that you're not stretching the parameter space and moving beyond the range of where those parameterizations have been validated Okay, so we are coming to the end of our time, and that was a very interesting and lively discussion. I appreciate everybody's input. I'd suggest we thank the panel for their...